All right, let's get uh, restarted. Let's see. Maybe this is better. Is it? Yeah. Let's get restarted. If you don't have a mug yet, don't forget to pick one up on your way out later. It's got a logo. It's got the full name. It's big. <laughs> Mine got water. Um, as a reminder for you. Um, so, in this session, what we want to do is highlight some of the recent research directions. So it's very different flavor from the lectures we've already had so far yesterday and today. It's not about necessarily going into all the details to show you how to make something work. It's more about giving you a high level overview and what are some of the exciting things that are happening at the research frontier. Curious, who here has written research papers in the past? Written? Wow, that's a lot. So almost all of you are writing research papers. Um, that's amazing. So, <laughs> you are contributing to the massive increase in research papers out there. So this is a um, number of papers in 2012, about 200 a month. And then by 2017, there was about 2,000 research papers written every month. And this just keeps increasing. So more and more papers coming out all the time because there's so many exciting things to work on and to push the frontier. It also makes it hard to keep up with everything um, because nobody can read 2,000 papers per month. Uh, it's just not practical. So um, luckily, sometimes people summarize some of these things. So what we're going to do here is look at a few directions that I think personally are very exciting. Um, we're not going to cover all of them. We're going to cover the ones on the left column. And the ones on the right column, we can do some questions about later. Maybe we're not going to cover uh, in the slides. So um, aside from covering research directions, the other thing we want to do is kind of take a step back and look at overall research teams across the many directions. And then also some pointers on how to keep up with research, given that there is so much being put out every day, pretty much. So the first direction I want to highlight is few shot learning. Few shot learning refers to the notion that you love for an AI system to learn from just a small number of examples. Um, in supervised learning, there's been a lot of success. But typically, success relies on tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of examples being annotated. And even though sometimes that's OK to do, it's also clear that um, it's costly. And in principle, maybe it shouldn't be needed. Because for example, um, there was a time in your life when hoverboards and one-wheel pluses did not exist. But then if somebody show you one hoverboard and one one-wheel plus, you would right away know, what's this one? It's a hoverboard. It's easy. Even though you might have seen it only once. This one, one-wheel plus. Very easy for humans to do. One-wheel plus hoverboard. So how come we can do this from just one example of each class, whereas our AI systems often need many, many, many more examples? Well, one way to think of it is, well, why can we do it? Um, well, maybe because we have a strong prior notion of what object categories are like. So maybe in the past, we have not just learned about what is a car, what is a dog, what is a cat, but also kind of for a given object category, what are typically the boundaries around it, and when does a new category start? And maybe we have learned that. We can reuse that when we learn about a new object category. So how do we equip a machine with such a prior? Well, we're still going to need a lot of data in the first phase of this approach. So maybe we'll look at ImageNet or something like that, a massive amount of labeled data. And maybe what we can do at a high level is somehow train something that doesn't necessarily learn about each individual category, but learns about the notion what is a separate category from other categories. And that can then be reused. So let's make this a little more pre precise. So let's start with standard computer vision practice, which is you would train on ImageNet, or maybe you have another representative data set for your problem. And then after you've done that, you fine tune on the actual task. 
And that works really, really well. And in many ways, it's kind of like two big breakthroughs in 2012 with the ImageNet deep learning breakthrough. One breakthrough was, wow, we can now recognize what's in an image. And the other one was, wow, what we trained on ImageNet, we can reuse it on other data sets. So still, you might have some questions about this. Well, how do you generalize this to maybe other types of learning, like learning behaviors, rather than just learning what's in an image? And also, this is kind of counting on you train on one thing, and then you fine tune on something else, and you count on it working. And yes, people have found this often works, but it's not necessarily guaranteed. And you're not really setting yourself up for guaranteed success. You're just training on one thing and hoping it'll still work on the other thing. So first we can ask ourselves the question, can we, from the beginning, know that we're going to fine tune? And since we know we're going to fine tune later, can we train our network to be ready for fine tuning rather than just train it on some data and hope it is ready for fine tuning? So key idea here is that we're going to see if we can do end-to-end -end learning of a parameter vector theta that is a good initialization for fine tuning for many tasks. So approach is called model agnostic meta-learning. Um, what does it refer to? It means it's an approach for meta-learning. Meta-learning is learning to learn. So we're going to learn in early on something that we can then use to learn more quickly later. That's the learning to learn aspect, or meta-learning. Model agnostic refers to the fact that there is nothing in the approach that we're going to discuss that's specific to the example we're going to look at here. It's a very general approach. So let's start with what we want at test time. And in some sense, that's often what we do anyway. Usually, we care about what you want to test time as good classification. Then you go back to training time and say, OK, let me try to classify some training examples, and hopefully it still works. So what do we want at test time? We want to be able to fine tune. What does it mean to fine tune? You have some pre-trained parameters, theta. And then you have some training loss on some trained data for some new task. And then the idea is that after you do a grant update based on the training loss, you end up with a new parameter vector theta prime and that new parameter vector theta prime is a good one. If that's the case, then fine tuning worked well. OK, so we can actually set this up at training time. Mammal training will be trying to set ourselves up for this thing to succeed. So what does that mean? Let's try to think about this a little bit ahead of time before I project the solution. We want this thing to be successful. What's happening here is we pick a new task, we do a grand update, and we hope that the resulting parameter vector is good. So to be ready for this, maybe at training time, we collect a wide range of tasks, many, many tasks. And then for each one of those tasks, we're going to expect that for the theta that we're going to end up with, we want it to be the case that a fine-tuning step leads to a good parameter vector. And if that's true for all training tasks, and now we essentially go from having training examples to having training tasks. And then we hope that it'll generalize to the test task at test time. So mathematically, we'd have a set of tasks. And for each task, we can define a validation loss based on the subset of the examples and a train loss based on the other examples for that task. We do an update based on the train loss and check how well the fine-tuned parameter is doing on the validation loss. And key here is that we share theta across all tasks, but the fine tuning, of course, is specific to each task. So each task is its own fine tuning, but we want to find a single parameter vector theta that can be shared across all of them. And if that's the case, if that works well in all training tasks, then you can expect if your test tasks come from a similar distribution, it'll also work well at test time. OK, so doing this with a picture, um, this is the equation that we're going to train against, that, which is now meta-training time. So we'll think about meta-training is when you do the training of this parameter vector theta. And at meta-testing, you then check when you fine-tune how well it does. So we learn a parameter vector theta. There are many, many tasks. These tasks will have different optimal parameter settings. And we're trying to find a vector theta that is such that from that vector, it's easy to reach solutions to other tasks in the future. OK, let's look at some standard data sets. So one of them is Omniglot, which is a handwritten character data set, where there is 
in some sense, many, many subtasks you can define because you could say, well, maybe there is, I don't know, 1,800 different characters and each character has 200 um, pictures of it. Then if you say, I'm going to do five-way classification, you can pick any subset of five characters from the 1,800 character set and train on that. And that would be a task. Same for mini ImageNet. ImageNet has many, many categories. But among those categories, you can define tasks as focusing on a subset of the categories only. So let's look pictorially at the ImageNet one. What happens at meta training time? At meta training time, we'll pick some training classes. So some set, subset of the classes we use for meta training, and then we'll test at meta testing time on the other classes. We'll take some classes, then we will define five-way classification problems on only those classes, and we'll try to find a parameter theta that is such that after one update, it does well on the test or validation data within the meta training classes. And then after a lot of training, we hope that when we get test examples, that it'll fine tune quickly and do well in the validation also for test. Any questions about the setup? So the meta training includes the testing portion? The, the test Correct. So yes, so the meta training, in, the meta training essentially tries to find the vector theta, a parameter vector theta, such that if you do a gradient update based on these examples, the fine-tuned parameter based on that one gradient update does well on these examples. And that same vector should be such that if you do an update based on these examples, you do well on these validation examples and so forth. And that's what it's trained for. Question here. How can we classify the meta training data set for this like, test set? We have lots of choices. How, how can we configure that? You mean, why put, a, let's say, mushroom and dog or uh, microphone or something in, in, the, in the meta training and the other one in meta testing? This is just randomly chosen here, just to evaluate and see what happens. But Let's, if we always do randomly, it might not work well. Um, well, I mean, you, you have different choices here. So if you, had, if you had an idea of what your meta testing situation would look like, you could definitely tune it to that. But in this setting here, there's no notion of knowing ahead of time what meta testing will be like. We just know that there is a large number of ImageNet classes and some random subset will be used for meta training, some random subset for meta testing. But it's definitely the case if, let's say, you for meta training use these ImageNet pictures and then meta testing you used Omniglot, it's not gonna do that well. I mean, it's probably gonna do very poorly. So you, this essentially what you have here is just like in, in standard supervised learning, you want your training and test data to come from the same distribution, be IID. Here, for this to have reasonable guarantees, you want your training tasks and test tasks to come from the same distribution over tasks. So we've replaced example by task, and otherwise we're making the same assumption. Training <coughs> task, same distribution as test task. Over there. So it's a good question. So I've presented it as one gradient update, but actually you can also set it up with multiple gradient updates. And what's happening underneath is if you look at the equation, you can, so this is the training equation, right? So this is what we optimize at training time. This can be optimized with autodiff auto packages like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Chainer, and so forth. Um, you can still do it if you allow for multiple updates instead of one grant update. It, it just becomes a longer chain through which you have to propagate. Um, and what you can also do is you can at training time only allow for one update because you say I wanted to train to adapt very quickly, but then at test time you allow for multiple updates because you know that gradient updates are pushing you in the right direction. Whether you are well pre-trained or not, it's always on expectation the right direction when you do gradient updates. And so that's one of the nice aspects of this type of learning to learn, this meta learning approach, because the fallback remains grain descent. And so if there is a massive mismatch between train and test tasks, you can just keep running grain descent on your test task until finally you might do well. Whereas some other 
meta learning approach is try to do something that's more black boxy and just learn, try to learn a general pattern of how to kind of quickly learn something. But then if you have a mismatch between train and test, that approach doesn't have a real fallback that's guaranteed to work in the infinite data limit. Whereas this, if there's a big mismatch between train and test, in the infinite data limit for test time, you'll still do the right thing. Question there. So is the output of all this like meta training a new model that takes an input of a pre-trained model and then a new task and then? Yeah, so the result of this is a neural network that will process if you train on mini ImageNet on small ImageNet images. And it was assuming to take something like that in and output a classification. Then what happens at test time, the classes have changed. So the last layer disappears because it's going to be different classes and you put on ra some random weights for the new last layer. But everything else is coming from this theta over here. Yes? Correct. Each row is a task. And we'll need many tasks to be able to generalize to new tasks in the future. So even though I've started off this whole discussion with we'd like to learn more quickly and from a small amount of data, um, you might need even more data here. But then later, after you've paid a price for training with a lot of data during meta training, you'll be ready to train quickly from a small amount of data for related tasks. Okay, so you need to be careful that when you sample seven here, that the two you use for validation are from the same um, five classes as these five are from. Right? So the task will always be a five-way classification here. So you'll get to see five examples, and then these need to be from the same classes. Otherwise, you will not be able to have learned anything about the ones that come at test time. But other than that, that's effectively what it is. You just randomly, for every, every time you can randomly sample, essentially randomly pick five classes, then pick one example from each for train, maybe one example of each class for test, and that, that will define the task for you. And you can keep repeating this, but you just gotta be careful that you never pull them from the meta testing range of classes. But other than that, that's exactly how you could implement it. Yes? Can we apply the same approach to the language modeling, let's say, to word embedding to make them more task-specific? So for language, we did not test this particular thing on language, but we tested it on something a little similar that I don't have here, which is dynamics models. So let's say you try to control a robot. And one way to control is just being reactive. You have an input, and you generate an output that hopefully does the right thing for you. Another way to control it is to say you have current input and then the robot has an internal simulator. And based on that simulator, it'll say, oh, um, let me think about what's going to um, happen next if I simulate forward. And that simulation forward is the closest what we've done to language models because that's effectively running out of RNN, predicting what's going to happen next. Action conditional because you think about sequence of actions you might take, but it's like a language model in many ways. And so then what you can see in those experiments is that you can train it this way in other worlds. They land in a new world, and you're ready to learn models quickly for that new world. And so you'll adapt to um, the new world. And actually, people do this without explicit training in language models. Often they will do, essentially, as they do evaluation on a new data set, they will do gradient updates and fine tune the model during evaluation. So as you, as you predict the next character, you'll after you've done that, you can't do it ahead of time, but after you've done that, you do a grand update to adapt to the current text. And that, that is kind of the same thing. If in addition to that, you train your model to be expecting that it'll get to do that, then effectively you get this. But I don't think people have done the training to expect that that'll happen. Yes? So the data that you showed here is um, parameters of the neural network, like the weights and Correct. the Correct. Mm -hmm. So the few shot learning, I think can be tested as a regularization like problem in which 
like we have a neural network that is trained with lots of data and we mm -hmm. want to add a few samples and adding these few samples should not change the neural network drastically. So the radio, you should not be uh, sensitive to Yeah, so the data. suggestion is one way to think of this, of this approach is to interpret it as a regularizer that when you train for a new problem, instead of regularizing to zero, which is somewhat standard regularization, you are effectively regularizing to something that's already worked well in the past on other problems. And I think that that's a reasonable way of thinking about this. So my question right now is what is the loss function that you suggest? The loss function here is And are there any constraints this. on the weight of the data, so on the weights of the neural network? Do we have any, impose any constraints? Do I do have, do have to impose any constraints on this one here? Yes. Uh, no. I mean, you might, if you have prior knowledge, you might impose some constraints to reflect your prior knowledge about the problem setting, but in general, you don't have to. This is, I mean, in your interpretation, essentially, this is training a network to, instead of later regularize around zero, find the best spot to kind of center yourself around to train from. Um, and so, that's the only, only thing you need in the objective here. Um, you need many tasks to sum over such that you can generalize. But yeah, question? So when you say many tasks, it's all classification tasks. Like here it is. I'll show some other tasks later. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how well does it work? Um, classification error. So one shot means that at Meta testing time, so you've trained on many, many tasks before, but then when you get the new task at meta testing time, you get only one example of each class. Five way means that there will be five examples total, one of each class, five classes. So one shot shows that on Omniglot, where there is 1,200 training classes and about 400 test classes, on test classes, the error of some competing approach is shown, and then the mammal approach lands right here at about 1% test rate. So from just one example, you can solve the five-way classification, well, five examples, you can solve the five-way classification problem up to 1% error rate. If you get five examples of each class, you can bring it down to around 0.02 something, uh, or 0.2%. And then here is 20-way, which means there is more classes, which makes the problem harder. But we still, but then um, we get, in some sense it's harder, in some sense it's easier because you get more examples. One shot now means you get 20 examples. Um, but you need to classify into 20 possible classes. We have about 4% error rate after one example of each and about 1% uh, error rate after five examples of each. So that shows that you can actually learn from a very small number of examples if your network has been trained to be ready to fine tune onto new problems. ImageNet um, or mini ImageNet, very similar. Um, five way, one shot can get to um, about 46% error and then five way, five shot to about 32% error. The other approaches listed there, LSTM optimizer, what that means is that instead of using a gradient update, you use an update that an LSTM has learned, that it thinks is a clever way of doing the update. Uh, it, it tries to beat gradient descent in some sense, but in this case, actually, it doesn't really help. And that's somewhat to be expected. It's very hard to learn a better update rule than gradient descent, um, unless your distribution is very narrow, in which case, of course, you can figure out what what you need to do. Um, then matching networks is a network architecture where instead of classifying into classes, you feed in two examples and ask whether they're the same class or not. So matching network has been trained on many past classes to decide whether or not images from those classes are from the same class or not, and then is now asked here to do the same thing. Yes? So it's a good question. Um, 
the first step would probably be just to eyeball it and see how similar they are. Let's say you look at, I don't know, a different domain. Maybe you're looking at radiology images, or maybe you're looking at, I don't know, um, some um, other medical images, x-ray, um, CT scans, and so forth. And you look at them, and then you might say, well, does it look the same as ImageNet images or not? You might say, well, maybe at the kind of, you know, really fine patch level, maybe it does, but at the global level, it probably doesn't. And they might think about, well, do I think that I can draw my conclusions from small regions, or do I need something more global? And they might decide, based on that, whether or not you, you consider it the same uh, type of task. Um, if you're not so sure and you have many, many other data sets, you could also consider weighting them. You could say, well, this one seems somewhat close. I'm going to, in my meta training, weigh them uh, pretty highly. And some other ones seem pretty far removed, but maybe there's still a little bit of signal. Maybe I'll weigh them um, a little less heavily in the objective. Um, in principle, you could also just see how well the, the meta training does, right? So if the meta training does pretty poorly, then that's one sign that the, all the tasks you have are very disparate and you're not able to find one parameter that really is able to jump onto all of them quickly. Yes? So I forgot, I forget what we did in, for this graph, but you can. So let me show you an example. So regression here is another case where you can try this out. Um, at meta training time, you have some x's and some function values of x, so just a one-dimensional regression problem. And at test time, you get new x's and you need to evaluate f. And you do this for multiple functions. And then at meta testing, you get a new function, you get only a small number of examples, and you hope you generalize. Now, a question, of course, I mean, can you expect to generalize? Well, that would depend on what you define as your functions. If you say, if literally every function is equal, every possible function is equally likely, then probably you're not going to be able to generalize from here to here. But maybe if, let's say, all the functions you consider are continuous and they're, or they're continuously differentiable, then you might already start learning a pattern that once you have some examples, you can generalize more quickly. Um, if you know they uh, maybe have a small Lipschitz constant, then maybe you can already learn more to generalize. Or in our case, what we did here as kind of just a, a way of testing the approach, we had all of them be sinusoids. So if all functions are sinusoids, then clearly there's a pattern to it. And you can still change the amplitude and the phase, and we'll have some region of amplitudes and phases that we use for training, and some other region that we use for testing. So, this is five shots, so you have five examples of the real function. Uh, you can, as a baseline, pre-train on all tasks. So you just kind of train on all the past data, which doesn't really work because you can't really fit all functions at the same time because they're different functions. But if they're very similar, then this would still work. Like if all your functions are extremely similar, you should be able to fit something that's roughly the average of them. Um, then we'll look at pre-update. So this is effectively, pre-update means like after fitting on all past data, this is the average function effect that you get out. You might say, why isn't it just going horizontal? Because it's all signs, and so the average of all possible signs is just a horizontal line. The reason it's not is because we would limit the amplitude and the phase to a certain range. And since the phase is limited to a certain range, effectively what we're seeing here is what is the average phase of the range that we were in. And the range is small enough that that doesn't average out to to all zero. Um, so both of them predict kind of if they have no data, essentially the same thing. The right one's been pre-trained on all past data to try to predict it, which is not really practical. The left one has been trained to be ready after seeing a few examples to adapt. And so now it has five examples. So you can do a grant update based on those five examples. Here's what you get. And it actually adapts very, very quickly. Um, if you do 10 gradient steps, on those same five examples, that's one of the questions, like you keep doing gradient steps, let's do more gradient steps, and it tunes even a little more closely to what it needs to be. Whereas if you start from um, essentially something that's trained on all past data, but not understanding that you still need to adapt, it's not able to adapt quickly at all. 10 shot, so more samples. Um, again, pre-update, meaning the average it's learned as what it saw in the training data then it incorporates the 10 examples in one gradient step. Here's what you get after 10 gradient steps, you get a pretty close fit. Um, let me give you a little more uh, readings on this. So <laughs> meta-learning for classification is a 
pretty popular topic because, well, a lot of people would like when they solve their own problem that they can rely on other people having solved other problems in the past to learn much more quickly on the new problem. And that's what this tries to do. So a lot of work out there. And I mean, we'll share the slides later so you can also um, take the references from the slides that you get. Since we had a lot of questions here, I think I'm going to skip over this demo for now and we can always revisit uh, later. Um, a great scope, Sergey already alluded to this earlier, but we actually use similar ideas for faster grading. And what does it mean to be a task here? A task is one homework problem, and there are, or one exam problem. And there have been many, many homework and exam problems. You can meta train on many of them from the past, and then hopefully when you meta test on new ones, it can adapt very quickly to how you are grading the new ones. You can also do meta learning for optimization. The idea there is that you say, oh, instead of um, just running gradient descent or coming up with something slight tweak like Adam or Adagrad or something, I'm going to learn the slight tweak to gradient descent. Or I'm even not going to learn a tweak to gradient descent. I'm going to learn this all from scratch. And there's two types of work in there. Some of them learn it as a modification to gradient descent. Some of them learn from scratch what to do. All the data you've seen so far, where should you go next? to hopefully optimize your function. Um, you can imagine that at the very least, if you learn from scratch from enough data, you should learn something like gradient descent, because that we know works in general if you spend enough time optimizing. Um, but sometimes if your data distribution is, or your optimization problem distribution is narrow enough in some way, you can learn things that are better than the rules that people have invented. You can do the same thing for generative models. So in unsupervised learning, you learn to generate, let's say, handwritten characters, then in principle, it should be possible at meta testing time to just be shown one example of a new handwritten character you've never seen before. And then it should be able to generate many versions of that character. Just like at training time, it saw that you know, there might be 200 different ways in the images of how somebody wrote the letter A. And then now at meta testing, maybe it sees B and it then says, OK, yeah, well, I know that there might be many ways to write this. And you can make it a little bigger, a little smaller, a little thicker pen stroke, a little thinner, and so forth. So these are some references for that. So now I want to switch gears to reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, there's an agent. And the agent gets to interact with the world by taking actions. Then the robot and environment, because the agent is kind of the brain of the robot in case of a robot. So the agent affects the robot in the environment. Things change, and the process just repeats over and over and over. And the way you define whether something's going well or maybe going poorly is by reward. So in contrast to supervised learning, where it's about do you match the output that somebody else would have given here, your annotator would have given, here it's about as you go through this loop, you do things in the world, are you maximizing how much reward you're collecting or not? Like if it's a financial agent, then maybe the reward is just some version of money and want to maximize how much money collected. If it's maybe a a cooking robot, then it could be related to quality of the meal and how messy your kitchen is after it's done cooking and so forth. So what are the new challenges? Why is this problem harder than supervised learning? Well, three main <coughs> new challenges. The first one is credit assignment. Since after the agent takes an action, you're not telling it whether it was good or bad, it needs to somehow figure out from maybe much, much later in time when it finally gets told this was a good thing or a bad thing you succeeded at or failed at, um, then it needs to go back and say, well, OK, today was a bad day. What did I do today? Um, which things might have contributed to today having been a bad day? And which things maybe were OK because I did them on other days that were good days? And so that kind of teasing apart, once you, let's say you give your, I don't know, wouldn't work with a dog this way. But let's say you're a dog, you give it a reward at the end of the day, and you say, hey, dog, today was a good day, or today was a bad day. And then it has to go think and say, wow, yesterday was a good day, today a bad day. What are the differences in what I did? And from that, tease apart what I should do the next day. That's credit assignment. It's very hard. This is also why you don't train your dog on a like, per day basis. You train it on a mostly per second uh, basis. <laughs> then there's much less to, to tease apart. Um, stability, once you have a feedback loop, you can destabilize a system. Um, and if you destabilize a system, it essentially starts building up a lot of energy. It might destroy things. And then it might be just over. And there might be no learning anymore. So while you're 
While in supervised learning, somebody gives you the data, here the system collects its own data and could potentially do something really unsafe in the process. And you might say, well, why not just then keep still? Well, you need to see new data, interesting data. It allows you to do things you've never seen before, so you need to explore. And so that's another challenge here is that you need to figure out what it means to do something interesting new. Because you can do a lot of things you haven't done before, but many of them will not be that interesting. So how do you explore in a smart way? Now, despite these challenges, there's been actually quite a bit of progress on reinforcement learning. For example, one of the big breakthroughs was in 2013 on the Atari games. Uh, Vlad Ni and collaborators from DeepMind and a lot of follow-up work out of DeepMind, Berkeley, OpenAI, and so forth. Um, and this is a neural net playing four of these games. And what's, what was so interesting about this is that this neural net at the time was the first one to be trained to learn to play a video game from its own experience, so that's reinforcement learning. But not only that, you could reuse that same reinforcement learning code and train another neural network to learn to play another game and then run it again to learn to play another game. And so you had one piece of code capable of training a neural network to train a wide range of games. Um, then a little later, AlphaGo happened. Um, of course, I mean, it's crazy. These days, I talk to students at Berkeley and say, oh yeah, AlphaGo, that's when happened in middle school and it really inspired me <laughs> you know, to get into AI. Um, I'm like, wow, it felt so recent to me. Um, <laughs> so the initial result happened in 2014 and the paper in 2015. So it is five years ago, so, um, but it still feels recent. And it was a big breakthrough at the time, even though maybe some kids might now take it for granted. Um, if you had asked somebody in 2012, there's actually a survey at the time, how long is it going to take before somebody solves the game of Go as a computer program that plays as well as best human players? Most of the votes were decades away, said like at least 20 years. But sure enough, it only took three years since that vote was taken. Um, so unexpected breakthrough. In hindsight, of course, it's easy to see why it works. I mean, essentially, it's also pattern recognition. And if you can do really good pattern recognition, then maybe you can do it on deciding whether it's a winning situation or a losing situation and which situation is better. So you don't need to think through the entire game tree. You can just think about your next move and already do pretty well that way. But that was not clear um, in you know, just five, six years ago. Same idea, reinforced learning, learn from your own trial and error, has been applied to learn to play a pretty popular video game called Dota 2. Um, interesting thing about the Dota 2 result and also the AlphaGo 0 result, which came after AlphaGo, that it was achieved by just playing against yourself. Initially, that seems very counterintuitive, that it's enough to play against yourself. Um, it's not entirely true. You play against many historical versions of yourself, so you're not overfitting to your latest self. Um, but actually, it's, the, it's in some way the right way to do it. Because when you're doing reinforcement learning, let's say this um, Dota 2 bot or GoBot was trained against the best player in the world. They would always lose. And so the credit assignment would just say, no matter what you do, you lose. But if you play against yourself, half of you wins, half of you loses. And so you get very clear signal on which random variation of how you played was better or worse in every game you play. And so whenever actually you can set up your problem as self-play, it helps a lot to do reinforcement learning much more easily than if you cannot do it. It's not always possible, not clear. For example, if you want a robot to cook for you, what the self-play version is of that. Um, but if you can come up with it, that might really boost the speed at which it can learn. At Berkeley here, we were at the time mostly focused on seeing if we can get this to work on robots. And here, we're watching the learning in action. So through its own trial and error, over time, it's updating the weights in the network till finally it figures out how to run. The reward here is the further you go to the right, the better. And the less impact with the ground, the better. And it turns out the exact same piece of code, this was with trust vision policy optimization and generalized advantage estimation, can be used to train a neural network to learn to play the video games, uh, the Atari games. And you can also train other robots. And that's part of the beauty, is that instead of needing to have very special purpose domain expertise about two-legged locomotion versus four-legged locomotion versus maybe six-legged, you can have expertise in what it means to learn from your own trial and error. And then have a neural network that can be trained to control many robots. In fact, been able to train it to do a very wide range of motions. This is work led by Jason Peng here at Berkeley, um, where the simulated robot has learned to essentially make any move that humans have made in a motion capture system. And here the reward function is how close does the robot motion match 
the motion captured motion. It doesn't need to be human-like characters. Here is a simulated lion, and the brain of this lion is a neural network that is deciding what torques to send to each of the joints in this line, and then there's some simulation on top of it to simulate the, uh, the muscle masses and the fur. And so what we can do now, if you do game design, instead of carefully orchestrating frame by frame by frame, what should happen to a character, you can just say go from point A to point B, run this fast, and then this thing will just do it for you. Um, you can do it with real robots. So this is Brett, the Berkeley robot for the elimination of tedious tasks. Um, lives on the seventh floor here. And here it's learned to stack Lego blocks. Um, takes about um, an hour for it to learn a vision system and a control system that can reliably stack this block. Um, initially, it might sound like a lot of time, because, I mean, you walk up there today, you're going to do it on first attempt, I'm pretty sure. I hope so. Um, <laughs> But in some sense, it's not your first attempt, because you've already done many similar things in the past. And this robot, when it's doing this, is learning it completely from scratch. We then actually had a collaboration with NASA on this robot. And I wonder, what, who designs robots this way? Well, NASA, um, but um, why? Why this robot? It's for planetary exploration. So these are some rods and then some cables, and if you um, Lengthen the cables a lot, because the cables are running inside these rods. They're going to wind up in there. If you lengthen them a lot, you can make this a nice little small package. It's a bit like a tent. You can make like a little package like a tent. But then if you tighten them up again, it'll take on this shape. At this point, it can also take impact on landing. So you need less airbag material than you would need otherwise. And then another advantage is, well, you might say, well, why not a rover with wheels? Um, but if you think about this, it's a sphere approximately, and so it's like having wheels in every possible direction. The only downside, or one of the downsides, is that it's not as clear how to control it compared to a car with wheels. And so it was hard to come up with a human design controller to control this thing reliably. But you run the same kind of reinforcement learning as for the other examples, and it learns to control this robot reliably, and this is over in Mountain View, not too far from here. The first time this robot was rolling reliably, um, Training was actually fully in simulation. We had many kind of versions of simulator trying to capture different aspects of, of this robot. And then testing happened on the real robot. Um, and then often there's a little loop there when the testing doesn't fully work on the real robot. You start thinking about why is our simulator missing some aspects of what's going on in the real world? Update your simulator a bit or randomize it a bit more and then rerun. OK, so definitely some successes with reinforcement learning despite these challenges. Um, for example, much better than human play in uh, Pong. But how good is the learning itself? And what I mean with that is that how long does a computer need to train before it does something good? Uh, there was a study on this for the Atari games. And roughly, a human can be as good as a computer, whether a human trains for 15 minutes playing a new video game, and a computer has been training for 115 hours. So several, of order, several orders of magnitude difference in how much experience is required. How to bridge the gap? Um, well, if you look at the existing RL algorithms, they're extremely general, which is nice, because you like a general approach that will always work. But there's a downside to this, in that the environments encountered in the real world are only a small subset of all the environments you can define mathematically. And so you're not really taking advantage of the fact that the real world has a lot of structure and that you can rely on that there being, again, the next time you face a new problem in the real world. So the question is, can we develop algorithms that take advantage of this? And so maybe one way you'd think is, well, let's think really carefully about the real world, Newton's laws, other things, and can we somehow push this into a neural network? Right? That's a bit like in computer vision saying, I want to be translation invariant, but I also want to be lighting invariant. Well, lighting invariant, much harder to push into the network. Um, maybe to do that, you actually just collect a lot of training data. Right? And that's an easier way to get it in there than to actually try to architect a network that's lighting invariant. Same for pose invariance. And think about computer vision. I want to be pose invariant. I want to recognize a chair no matter which direction I'm looking at. Well, are you going to put that in the structure of the network? That's really hard to do. But you just make your network big enough, collect a lot of data with things seen from different viewpoints, it'll absorb it on its own. So maybe we can do the same thing here. So maybe we can have an agent that will be faced with environments and somehow absorb the essence of those environments, such that in the future, it already has all of that expertise somehow in its network. And when it's dealing with something new, it can learn more quickly. 
Let's dig one level deeper into that agent. There's an RL algorithm that lives in there and a policy. The policy is the neural network and interacts with the world. There's the interaction loop. And then the algorithm just watches these interactions and is supposed to update the parameters to make them better for future performance. In environment A, it'll learn a policy for environment A. In environment B, it'll learn a policy for environment B and so forth. But as I said, the existing algorithms humans have designed are not that great. They take a long time to learn. Um, so maybe we should actually forego designing the algorithm and also learn that, so that they can somehow automatically account for the structure in the real world that is very hard for us to directly code into it. And so the algorithm will absorb data in some sense. It'll be a data-driven algorithm that can hopefully learn more quickly than a human-designed algorithm. So what does, what does that mean pictorially? There's a bunch of environments, just like in the learning to classify with mammal, same thing here. There he had a lot of classification tasks. He will have a lot of environments. Then the meta algorithm will interact with those environments, collect data there. Much similar to mammal, it'll want to learn to learn quickly in each one of those environments, such that when faced with a new environment, it can learn very quickly too. Okay, one way to phrase this formally is that there's now an agent. And this agent, rather than just being in one environment, it'll be dropped in a sampled environment. Doesn't know ahead of time which one it's going to be. Then it gets a number of trajectories in that sampled environment. And within those small capital K number of trajectories, it needs to do well. For example, it gets a new video game, gets to play five times, and should get a high score. Then it gets another new video game, gets to play five times, should get a high score. That's how this is formulated. And saying, I want to find an agent that does well on this objective. And then the hope is, I've done this with enough video games, then hopefully the next video game in the future, the meta testing video game, it'll also learn to play well in just five attempts at playing the game. Pictorially, we look something like this. There's the agent interacting with the environment here for one episode, then game over, then the second episode, and then it gets switched to a new game. So here it only gets two episodes, meaning only two attempts at each game. If it can do well at this objective, it means it knows how to play a new game in just two attempts, which would be pretty amazing. Uh, in practice, we sometimes allow more than two, but this is just what fits on the slide here. Okay, so we can meta-train this. So we can say, okay, this is what we want. Good performance on randomly chosen new environments. Well, we take a bunch of meta-training environments and optimize this objective in the meta-training environments, and hopefully that means it generalizes to the meta-testing environments. We still need to decide what this agent is going to be. How about a recurrent neural network? A recurrent neural network is a generic computation architecture. It can generically process past experience to decide what to do next. That's the most generic thing we could hope for, something that uses all past experience to do as well as possible in the future. The weights in the network correspond to the algorithm that's encoded for learning, because as you're acting in a new environment, you're updating the activations. How are you updating them? Based on the weights. The activations themselves uh, correspond to what is your current policy that you have. This objective on its own can be optimized with a reinforced learning algorithm. So what we can do is we can say we're going to learn a recurrent neural network that is good at doing well in randomly new, random new environments in a small number of episodes. And after we've learned that recurrent neural network that is good at this, it should be ready to then quickly do well in new environments. Standard test case would be bandits. Why bandits? Bandits are a simple problem. So in a bandit problem, you might, for example, maybe you have five bandits in front of you. What you get to choose is which one of the five bandits' arms you pull. Each bandit has its own probability of payoff. Some of them will have high probability of payoff, some low probability of payoff. It's about discovering which one is the high probability of payoff through trying repeatedly, and then zoning in on that one to maximize your reward. Why is this an interesting problem? It's kind of the simplest reinforcement learning problem possible. There is exploration, trying things you haven't tried before and learning from that. And there's exploitation, using what you discovered to maximize your reward. And actually, humans have come up with provably optimal algorithms that, on expectation, will maximize reward in these settings. So then we can compare. We have an agent, put it in front of many, many of these multi arm banded problems. That's the meta training. Then we put it in front of a new multi arm banded problem and see how well it collects reward and compare that with the human designed algorithm put in front of that new bandit. 
Here's what happens. The best human designed algorithm shown here for different settings of number of bandits and number of pulls you get to do. And over there on the right is the learning to reinforce and learn. And it does about as well as the best human designed one, which is asymptotically optimal. So that's a good sign. Um, then some problems where humans don't know how to design asymptotically optimal algorithms like learning to control robots. So here, what's the distribution over tasks is the direction in which the robot should run and the speed at which it should run. So it's somewhat narrow distribution over tasks admittedly. It's uh, just about speed and direction. At training time, there are some speeds that get put forward. And then at test time, speed requirement is going to be something different. Here's this in action. Oh, that didn't play. Let's see. Here in the first episode, it's already able to run forward and backward. Here the reward is for zero speed. And in the first episode, we're always watching the very first episode in learning for a new reward function it hasn't dealt with before. Of course, in other reward functions before, um, we see it adapts extremely quickly, pretty much from the first time tick in the first episode. Same thing happens for Ant. It's able to adapt from pretty much the first time tick in the first episode to do well in this uh, new setting, which would be new speed requirement. How about something even harder, a wider distribution over task, navigation. So an agent gets dropped in a new building, is supposed to find a destination, which is marked in red, but the agent does not have access to the map. Agent just knows that in the building, somewhere there is a red spot. I got to go find it. So it's a maze solving task. Just gets first person vision, steer two degrees to the left, two degrees to the right, or keep going direction it's already going. If you randomly walk around in a maze like that, this is what you get. So that doesn't do much for you. If you have your agent trained in many, many mazes before, and then you drop it in the mazes never been in before, this one here, remember, it doesn't have access to the map. Here's what happens. It's learned that running down hallways is good. Looking around corners is good. And then once it sees the target, it runs to it. It's getting two episodes per maze here. And so it remembers from the first run enough. So in the second run, it can go right away to the target without wasting time. Look at the details, though. It doesn't always work. What are we looking at here? This one, we have different random seeds where we tried to train a recurrent neural network to be a learning to navigate mazes agent. And about 2 thirds of them work pretty well, and one third of them don't. Um, what exactly is going on here? Horizontal axis is iteration, so the number of updates we made to the neural network. Vertical axis is performance on a maze you've never been in before. So it's being tested on mazes it's never been in before, and sometimes it actually learns very quickly, sometimes it doesn't. What could be going on here? Well, where else have you seen this kind of split between train and, well, when you're training, you've seen this with train and test curves, so sometimes there's a split. But that's not what's happening here. This is actually all test curves, just different random seeds. So with some random seeds, it does well, and it does really great, and some of them it does not. What does it mean to not learn? Well, the reason it might not learn is because when it's exploring, it never gets lucky. And when it never gets lucky, or it takes a really long time to get lucky and find a destination, it gets very sparse rewards and doesn't get much signal and has a hard time learning anything. That is um, effectively what's happening here. Another thing that could happen in principle, but it's not what's happening here, is that it's overfitting. That in the latest maze it was in, it learned what to do there, and then it goes to the next maze, and it just repeated what was useful in the previous maze, and it just kind of is stupid like that and keeps doing that. But that's easy to avoid. That you can just avoid by regularizing more. You don't let it update the weights all that much based on the previous experience. But this underfitting is a real issue. It means that it's just not getting enough signal. Part of it is that the rewards are sparse. Part of it is that it's a very long horizon. You might be running on for 1,000, 2,000 steps before you get any reward. Propagating that signal through a recurrent neural network, even if it's the LSTM, which is supposed to have less issues with exploding and vanishing gradients, even then it's hard to get that through. So there's a new architecture um, which can do better. And in fact, this architecture has done better in, in other domains too. It's called Simple Neural Attentive Meta Learner. And it replaces the LSTM with a dilated temporal convolution. And it also uses the attention is all you need architecture, the transformer architecture, to still get enough detail. Because all you do is a dilated convolution. You lose a lot of information. But if you also have attention 
going back to things, you can still get the detail that you need. And so if you do this as an alternative to an LSTM, I mean, shouldn't surprise you too much, maybe if you've seen some recent results on language generation. I mean, this was done, uh, we did this two years ago, so two years before the recent language generation results, essentially having similar observation that you can you know, do so much better with attention. But um, same idea, signal propagates better, and you can solve much larger mazes. So also larger bandit problems. So larger bandit problems are being solved. That's just some numbers here illustrating that. And then we can solve larger mazes. What do they look like? Um, something like this. So this is an agent that's been trained in many mazes in the past to become good at learning to navigate them. It's dropped in a new one, it's never been in. And remember, it does not have access to the map and it knows how to navigate this maze reliably. You might say, well, why does it take so long? Um, wouldn't the smarter agent just go straight down and go there? It does not have access to the map. It doesn't know. It doesn't know where to try first. Being smart here means being clever about not wasting time and exploring this maze exhaustively till you happen to run into the solution. Um, the reason I picked this one to showcase is because it's unlucky. And that way you can see it's smart and doesn't waste time doing the same thing over and over. Then, um, here are a few more references on meta-learning for reinforcement learning. Here, the task distribution corresponds to different environments most of the time. Um, sometimes different environment means different dynamics. Sometimes it means different layouts, which is like different dynamics. Sometimes it means different reward functions, like in the AND and Cheetah running examples. People continue to build new environments. Um, Visdoom is the one for navigation that we looked at. DeepMind Lab has some variations of environments. Mujoka has different environments. And about half a year ago, OpenAI put out another set of environments, which are essentially a range of games on which you can kind of randomly generate a new game, which would then be a new environment you could be faced with. OK, let's see. Um, yes, question. So the epsilon value for the agent, yes. it's supposed to learn that on its own. But there's two, two epsilon values. There's an the epsilon value that it has to use on its own when dropped in a new environment. And there is the epsilon assumptions that we use to meta train. And that one, we get to control. So during meta training, when we train the recurrent neural network or the um, dilated temporal convolution plus attention is all you need network, at the meta training time, we do uh, get to play with epsilon. And you can play with things like curriculums. You can first go in small mazes, so it gets signal more, a little more easily, then expand to bigger mazes, and hopefully it can you know, reuse what it learned in small mazes, to then also start getting some rewards in bigger mazes and so forth. And so playing with epsilon is one thing to affect your exploration. Often very important, but even just as important, more important is making sure you have maybe a gradual uh, increase in difficulty of your tasks if you can. Yes? Can you say something about partially observable environments versus fully observable? Yeah, so partially observable environments are environments where in the current observation, even if you have perfect computer vision, you can understand everything you see, you still cannot know everything about the state of the world that you're in. Those are harder problems because that means that you somehow need to remember things from the past to piece together from everything you've seen what might be the distribution over possible current worlds rather than knowing that there's a specific current world state. And so the maze navigation is an example of that kind of problem because you don't know where you are, um, you don't know the layout of the maze, and so you have a lack of information compared to something where you can see everything. Um, yes? Correct. You backpropagate. You, when you compute your gradients, they're actually going through another gradient operation. Yes? To work in real world scenarios? So, what are the challenges to get to real world scenarios? I would say that when you look at all the examples I've shown to you, the distribution over tasks is still very narrow. Um, real world has much more variation in it. 
If all you wanted was, let's say, maze navigation in the real world, I bet we could find a way to make it work um, because that's not going to be too different in simulation from real world. The essence is that you somehow memorize some things about the path you followed and so forth. So if that works in simulation, I don't see why it wouldn't work in the real world. But real world is many other things. Then maybe you're navigating some building and now you need to open a door or you need to take an elevator or then maybe you need to push a chair to the side to be able to get through. Or maybe there's people running around and they're not always in the same place, so there's variation and you need to understand that. And so there's just a lot more complexity. And so when you look at these meta-learning results, they work really well. When you have a well-defined training distribution, test distribution that are lined up in terms of what kind of tasks you see. And the, essentially the coverage that we are able to handle for now is only very narrow distribution compared to what we see in the real world. Yes? Yeah, let me say something about that in uh, the next uh, section of the presentation. Yes? Uh, how, is there any research going into the reward function? Yeah, so the question is, is there any research going into the reward function? So there's two parts to this question. If you're a practitioner, the reward function is available to you. You can make it whatever you want to make it. And so that's very powerful. So you can now design a reward function that might make learning easier, and that's called reward shaping. So maybe, I don't know, the goal is for um, your robot to make a good meal, and the real reward is how much you enjoyed the meal. But you might reward shape. You might say, okay, when you know, the robot opens the fridge, it already gets some reward because it needs to get ingredients, and when it actually successfully takes out some ingredients, you get some more reward. And then so this kind of keeps going. If you think through the process of what the robot should be doing to succeed, you can associate reward with every step along the way. If you do that, learning will happen a lot more easily than if just at the very end of the process you say, okay, this was a good meal or a bad meal, because most likely the robot didn't make a meal. Most likely it's just been busy doing random motions that didn't lead anywhere. All right? And so reward shaping is very powerful to get things to work in practice. It could be to give guidance on where to go. It could also be about giving guidance where not to go. So reward shaping can help you avoid parts of the space that are dangerous. You might know ahead of time you should never go there. And principles shouldn't matter. Principles say, well, if it goes there, the robot's dead, so it should know they never go. But once the robot's dead, it's not practical anymore to do the next attempt. So you want to say, okay, stay away from this part. Don't go near the cliff because you might fall off the cliff and so forth. Even though it's not bad to be near the edge of the cliff, as long as you don't tumble off. The robot's too stupid in the beginning. It might tumble off, so you reward shape to keep it away. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. On the flip side, from a research point of view, often you want to keep the reward fixed. So there's a very clear calibration. When your algorithm goes up head to head against another algorithm, which one is better? And you don't want it to be like, which human came up with a better reward function to make the problem easier? You want it to be, okay, which algorithm can actually do better? Or which neural net architecture, when used with a certain algorithm, absorb information better than other neural net architectures? Uh, but definitely in practice, you want a reward shape. You really care about solving a problem. You reward shape a lot. In the case of failure, how we can make the system explainable? And also, in order to improve the um, chance of success, how we can bring reasoning mm -hmm. to the neural network? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so the question was how to make the network explainable because it's a black box, and let's say it, it failed. Can you understand why it failed and maybe make some changes? Or maybe if it's about to, I mean, if it's going to do something, let's say make a medical decision for you, this surgery or that surgery or no surgery, you know, do you just want to look at the statistics of how often did it succeed or do you want it to be able to say something like, this is why, this is what I see in you specifically as a patient, that's why I'm recommending this, and I've seen this in other, these and these other, that's called explainable AI type research. Um, Trevor Darrell at Berkeley is an example of, you know, a, his group has done a lot of work in this direction. So his name is Trevor Darrell, last name Darrell, D-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. And there's actually a DARPA program called XAI, which has many groups participating, uh, working in that direction. So let's see, I think I have 16 minutes, which means we're not gonna cover everything here. Um, but I'm gonna give you a quick whirlwind of some of those things, and then we'll see uh, where we're at. So instead of learning from your own trial and error, maybe you want to learn from demonstrations. It might be a lot easier because you see how it's done, you can then imitate it. Actually, there's been quite a bit of success in that. 
But the same issue has been happening there as what I highlighted with reinforcement learning, which is for any given task, you need a lot of data to then you finally learn to imitate, solve the problem. But then any new problem needs new data. Can we do something similar again? We saw meta-learning for classification, meta-learning and reinforcement learning. Can we do meta-learning for imitation? What that would mean is you see a bunch of demonstrations. From that, you somehow absorb the essence of what it means to demonstrate something. And then when you see one new demonstration of something new, you just succeed from that one demonstration, which many humans can do. You can give one demonstration of something and they understand what they're supposed to do. Here's one way to formulate this. If you want to learn from one demonstration, at meta training time, you're going to get two demonstrations. One demonstration is the one you'll also have at test time. And you're supposed to, from this one demonstration, by just seeing the current situation, predict what to do. But since you have two demonstrations, the second demonstration can supervise what needs to come out of here. And effectively what's happening is you're looking in your, in your current situation in demo two, you try to make a decision by indexing into the first demonstration, the entire video demonstration. You index into that, see wh where the similarities are. You see where is this in this demonstration. You see the similarity and then use what's happening there to decide what to do now here. And this is fully supervised learning. This is exactly supervised learning. So we phrased meta learning for imitation as a supervised learning problem where you need two demonstrations of each task. And you need to be able to index into the one demonstration to be able to decide what you should do during the other demonstration. This is block stacking, this is a project that we did at OpenAI. And on the left, you see the demonstration. And on the right, you see the um, execution of the policy, which just from one demonstration understands which blocks have to go onto which other blocks and so forth. Um, you can also do this with a mammal-like approach. I'll skip over that, uh, over the details here. But let me show you a result. Here is a human demonstration. So now the one demonstration is a human demonstration, and the one it's supposed to predict is the execution of its own same principle, right? It's just now your pairs of demonstration at meta training time are one human, one machine. And you're supposed to learn to index into the human demonstration to know what the machine should do now. And so that's exactly what's happening here. The peach was put into the red bowl, and the robot has watched that video, understands what to do, puts the, puts the peach into the red bowl. Um, question, how about those simulators? Are they any good? Do they match the real world? Um, is Josh in the room right now? No, no Josh? Well, Josh is the world expert on this, um, so I'm going to cover some of his work um, in his absence. Uh, so if you have simulator, What's nice about it is it's less expensive than running things in the real world. It's faster to run things off and more scalable, less dangerous, and easier to label. But how can we learn something useful for the real world in a simulator? Because usually there's such a big mismatch. Well, approach one would be to say, well, why don't we build a realistic simulator? And yes, OK, that's a solution. But then a lot of the challenges come back. How do you build a realistic simulator? Very hard to do, very expensive to run, and so forth. Another approach people have worked on for a while is this thing called domain confusion. It's essentially where your neural network, when it takes in an image, it's supposed to not know whether it came from the real world or from a simulator. So your network processes for a while, and then there's some kind of layer at which you say, at this point, you should not be able to tell the difference between real world or a simulation. If you do that, then everything that comes after should generalize across the two. The tricky part is that forcing it to not know whether it came from real world or simulation is actually forcing a lot of information to disappear. And that's a force that is hard to deal with when you're training. Completely different idea. If the model sees enough simulated variation, the real world may look like just the next simulator. So it's again a meta-learning type idea. If you see enough variation at training time, maybe the next thing is just yet another one, um, even if it's not exactly the same as what you've seen before. So maybe you can have many, many versions of how you render. The real world is yet a different way of rendering, but it's fine because you have dealt with so many variations of rendering that now in the real world, you're able to deal with it too. Very low fidelity rendering on the left, by the way. So that's done because that allows you to render very fast. And the hope here is that 
since the essence remains the same, which is you care about shape and pose, and you don't care about lighting or texture, let's say, that you can capture that with massive simulated data set and still work well in the real world. First kind of convincing result in this direction was by Fergie Sodegi and Sergey Levin uh, here at Berkeley. And what they showed is that you can train in simulation for a quadcopter to navigate hallways, which is find the most wide open spot, and then reliably deploy it in the real world. It'll also fly to the most wide open spot. Then Josh's work with many collaborators at OpenAI looked at, can you do this more precisely? Can you look at, let's say, objects you might want to pick up? And instead of just finding what's the most wide open space, where exactly is the object you care about? Can you localize it by training just in simulation and then hope it'll still work in the real world? Here are, here's a training curve, horizontal axis, number of training samples, all in simulation, zero training in the real, from real world data in thousands of images. And then vertical axis is the average error evaluated on real world images. So you see that training and simulation is enough to drive down the error on real world images. You can also investigate what matters as you randomize. And let's say, you know, we have a lot of randomized images. What if we look at the number of textures? The number of unique textures matters a lot. If you only have 10 unique textures, you don't really get that far. But if you have about 10,000 different textures, so a lot of different textures, when you randomly generate your scenes, you can do a lot better. Another thing you could ask is, well, how about ImageNet pre-training? Maybe I can just pre-train on ImageNet, then train in a simulator, and that's going to be better because I already know something about the real world, and then I bring in some simulation stuff, and I can do good on the specific task I care about. Turns out it doesn't really help you. Pre-training with ImageNet, yes, sure, it starts here, um, but after about 4,000 images, purely trained in simulation does equally well. This 4,000 simulated images is enough for the task we care about here um, to do as well from just simulated training data. How about something else like grasping? You want to pick up objects. How are you going to randomize that? Um, well, the way this was done is to say you, there's a few meshes out there. Let's, let's say a few thousand meshes out there of objects. That's too little to cover the space of real world objects. But what if you slice up those meshes and randomly recombine them? Now we can generate a very wide range of objects. Now that might be realistic, but there's a lot of variation. Turns out, again, that's enough to train a um, network that can do, well, let's not dive into the details of numbers here. Let's watch a video instead. But that can do really well at picking up real world objects. So what you see here is the robot reliably picking up real world objects. It's never been trained with images from the real world, objects from the real world. It's just been trained with these random meshes, randomly recombined. You can take this a step further. So how about a full hand? So this is also a project at OpenAI um, led by Wojciech Zaremba. And what's going on there is um, essentially the question asked is, if you train only in simulation, can you learn a controller that is good enough to control this hand in the real world? You might say, well, why, why do you care about training in simulation? Again, the amount of training data required in reinforced learning, if you want to train this all in the real world, it's not practical. You need to train a simulation with the amount of training data that tends to be required. So then the question is, can your simulator be good enough? Why not just build one really good simulator? People tried for many years. Nobody has managed to build a hand simulator that's good enough. If you train a network on that simulator, it'll just work in the real world. So the hypothesis here was that maybe if you have many simulators, all different, if you can train a network, an adaptive network, that from the current experience in the current simulator adapts itself to what it's experiencing, can do well in each one of those simulators, meaning adapt quickly to no matter what simulator is in, maybe it'll adapt quickly to the real world. Turns out that was indeed the case. And so what you see here is some of the, probably the most advanced in-hand manipulation done by any robot, fully autonomous, trying to match the configuration of the, hand, of the block shown over there. And so underneath of it is a lot of domain randomization. So many randomized simulators then learning to adapt quickly to a new simulator tested out in the real world, which is just another new simulator in some sense. So um, 
architecture search, I'm going to go really fast here. Um, essentially, a lot of people do architecture search. That's what a lot of people do when they try things out. They say, let me try a different architecture. Maybe it'll work better. Well, if you have a lot of compute, um, you can maybe replace this current practice of you know, data plus computation plus ML expertise by data plus 100 times as much compute. Um, and you just give the computer a recipe for generally what you would try out. Now, obviously, most humans tend to be a little better at picking what to try out. So maybe it'll have to try out 100 times more things than you would try out. But you can just step away from it. It'll just be doing it all on its own. Um, in computer vision, a lot of progress was made with better architectures. You can, and that was mostly done by humans initially. But now it can be done with computers searching over architectures. Um, same in LSTM models for language. And then you can do actually the same thing with pre-processing of data. Um, everybody likes to enlarge their data sets and plays all kinds of schemes like lighter, darker, um, shifting things around, rotating things a little bit. You can essentially define a vocabulary of that and just let it learn which um, elements of that vocabulary are more important, less important to generalize well to new data. So that was really fast, um, but the slides are, will be there for you. Unsupervised learning. The main rationale on unsupervised learning is that label data is expensive to get. Can we learn a network that embeds the data such that when we use this embedding rather than the original raw data, we can learn something more quickly on that representation? Could be through pre-training, or it could be by specifically generating embedding vectors. Um, summarizing some main families of models here, we're going to skip through this and let you read this. Um, but show you this example here. This is an example of faces automatically generated by a genetic adversarial network trained by NVIDIA at pretty large scale on many, many example images to generate images that look like real images. And indeed, it's capable of doing that. What's interesting is that there's another unsupervised learning work. If you look at the latent variables, you can find latent variables that correspond to meaningful things, which means you can now start editing these images. You can say more smiling, less smiling of the same person. You can also translate from image to image, uh, horses to zebras. You can do Photoshop. Um, you can compress things this way. Because if all you need for an image is a code that can then, by a neural, net neural network, be turned into an image, then all you need is the code, and the receiver, of course, needs the neural network to turn it back into an image. Do the same thing with text. Um, lifelong learning. I think this is actually one of the biggest challenges ahead and ties into a lot of questions you have asked. A lot of your questions were about, what about train and test it? What if they're not lined up and so forth? Lifelong learning is in some sense exactly about that, that things will always be changing from underneath you. And how can you learn a system somehow, set up a system that as things keep changing, you keep adapting well and keep doing well and every time the new, new, and yet new type of environment. I'm going to not dive into the specifics here. Um, we'll let you look at those later. Oh, and a couple of people asked you about covariance. So let me say something quick about that. Um, talked about a lot of research progress in the slide so far. There's so much re research progress being made that we thought actually the gap is getting really large between what's in robotic automation in the real world and what's happening in research labs. And so we decided, with a few of us, to start a new company where we bring modern AI into robotic automation. So if you want to talk more about that, um, just reach out to me. Um, we're growing quickly, so we're hiring a lot of people. So uh, if robotic automation is something you're excited about, let me know. Let's see. We have one minute left. That's not much. Um, I think I'm just going to flash the slides so you know what you can look at later. There's trends uh, from more initially a lot of human input into designs of architectures to mostly automatically generated. Same in reinforced learning. Algorithms more and more automatically designed, learning to learn. Why can we do this? More and more compute coming our way. And so the more compute we have, the more we can do that meta learning, which is actually very compute intense, to then learn more quickly in the future. Some of the compute comes from dedicated neural network chips. Um, we can also compare with human compute. Here's a little listing showing that actually for about $30 an hour, we can rent the petaflop, which is roughly the compute in the human brain, and the, rent it in the cloud. Um, we don't have like the software of the human brain to run on it yet, but it shows that it's actually quite affordable to run human equivalent uh, compute. 
and the amount of compute used in experiments keeps going up very, very quickly. So at a high level, what I think it means when you're doing research is that, yes, there's data, compute, and human ingenuity that I need to bring together. But then you think about, should I do this, where there's mostly human ingenuity, or this, where it's mostly data and compute? You might initially think maybe you want to be here, because maybe you're pretty smart, and this is kind of highlighting like the ingenuity as something quite important. But the downside of being here, if everything kind of relies on human ingenuity, is that everybody's been able to do it like for the past 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. Um, if that's what you rely on. You're competing with Gauss, Newton, Einstein, everybody before you, very smart people. Whereas if you are willing to work in this domain, where most of what you do relies on having lots of data, lots of compute, Newton did not have the compute you have today, neither did Einstein, neither did anybody even just two years ago. And so you're just kind of comp competing with people today, not people from the past. And then you get new opportunities, new low-hanging fruit that did not exist before. And so in that sense, I think learning to learn and everything going in that direction is much more promising to get you some fast results that are new and exciting than doing something that's purely something that people could have done many, many years ago. You might wonder how much compute do we use here? Maybe not as much as we'd like. If anybody wants to give us more compute, let us know. Um, each PhD student at Berkeley uses roughly four to eight GPU machines for some local development and maybe two to five K per month in cloud compute. Um, so you can think of it as a lot or a little, I don't know, depending on where you're from. If you're at Google, you're probably thinking, oh my God, I'd you know, use that in one day, what you use in a year. Um, but um, this is maybe a good way of calibrating what it takes to write some of the papers that we're writing and that this is enough to do the work that we're doing. Um, of course, more can always help. Trending towards more, um, but that's kind of uh, not there just yet. How to keep up? Um, I think key things that we have in the slides here is how to read a paper. A lot of detail about it. I'll let you read it on your own. But key messages, don't read it character by character from start to finish, because you'll end up reading a lot of papers that are not that interesting after the fact to you. Um, so you've got to read in a more careful way, um, top down a bit more. What papers to read? Maybe just read all the papers. Not really that <laughs> feasible. Um, here are some pointers of where you might get some inspiration for what papers to read. Newsletter, Archive Sanity, which is a collaborative filtering system for paper reading. Um, Twitter has a lot of people posting papers they like. Um, there's a Facebook group. There's an ML subreddit. These could be sources for you to find out which papers to read. Um, save you time not reading many of the papers. Having a reading group is a really good idea. Um, because if you have a reading group, um, let's say, even just five people, which is not a lot, this can save you about 80% of the reading work. Um, even if it's just two of you, you can already save 50% of the work by being two of you. Because whenever the other person read a paper and it was a bad paper, you don't have to bother anymore. When it's a good paper, they can probably summarize it to you in a couple minutes, whereas it would take probably much longer to actually read and understand it. And so as you try to keep up, I would very highly recommend to at least have one other person trying to keep up with you to save yourself a lot of time. Thank you. <laughs>